This is the Full Disclosure Show here on the Restoring the Faith Media channel. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Mike. And I'm Joe. And I'm Joe. (laughs) In this show, we're bringing you up close and personal with notable authors, speakers, and broadcasters from various academic, media, and even ecclesiastical backgrounds so you can learn more about their personal story. Please subscribe to this channel. Please hit the bell. And please share this uh, channel with your friends and family so that we can make this channel grow faster. This show is designed to be an intimate and informative interview up close and personal with the men and women who are engaged in the Catholic topics of the day and the fight for a Christian culture at large. Some of the guests on this show will have strong and even controversial points of view. We want to make it clear that the views expressed by our guests do not necessarily represent the views expressed by the RTF family. If you'd like to hear more from me and Joe and the rest of the RTF family, please check out our weekly podcast, which is on YouTube and in Podcastville, called Living the Faith. Our guest today is Dr. Siobhan Nash Marshall, a professor of philosophy and the Mary T. Clark Chair of Christian Philosophy at Manhattanville College in New York. She is the vice president of the board of CINF, of which she is a co-founder. She is a prolific author, writer, speaker. Her latest publications include The Problem of Evil, uh, Black Swans, The Greek Principle, and Western Short-Sightedness, and something that I think will be a personal favorite of mine, The Sins of the Fathers, Turkish Denialism, and the Armenian Genocide. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome aboard. Thank you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure, an honor, actually. Well, we we uh, feel likewise. Um, I want to get into it. You are at currently at a secular college. Is that is that right? It is. And how how has that been for you, being a uh, a woman of faith, uh, teaching at a secular college? Well, I make people uncomfortable, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I suppose I suppose any dissenting uh, opinion from the party line, and by that I mean the communist party line at these universities these days, is uh, it makes people uncomfortable. Very. Excuse me, gentlemen. One second. This is my turn. I have a feeling the enemy of man does not want us to do this interview. Oh. So I'm going to grab my water. Oh dear. And here we go. It's my turn. <laughs> not a mm. problem. You are you're having a uh, what's that? You're se- having a Senator Marco Rubio moment. It's the uh, it's the yes, water I water am, moment. I am. It's blue blue water. Ah, good. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's very uncomfortable for them for a simple reason: is that if I do not understand something, I ask, and they don't have an explanation. Mm. So you know the the problem with today's culture is that it's not culture. It's a st- set of stock phrases that people need to repeat to feel good about themselves. Uh-huh. I'm sorry if I'm being controversial, but I will stand behind what I say. And and if you ask them to explain what do you really mean, they have no answer. Mm. So I'll give you an example from a, from a classroom. Um, I was explaining to my students that I think the most important thing about being white or rich or yellow or green or whatever is to be a good human being, to use the resources that God has given you. And use them wisely and well for the benefit of everyone. I think that's an obvious truth. Mm-hmm. But of course, you take offense. Yeah. yeah you, and I'm called racist. But here's the funny thing about that. I had a student in that class, by the grace of God, who was black, blind, and I'm not going to say elderly, but over 60 for sure. Wow. And he said to the girl, no, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and, and, he, and he knows more about listening than most people. <laughs> He's <Yeah>. paying attention. <laughs> but, he, but you see, that's the problem today. The young are repeating these stock phrases that they don't understand, wow. that they hear. And with my colleagues, it's the same sort of thing. They're, they're more verbal, the more glib, mm-hmm. Snarky. but there's still no foundation. So I make people uncomfortable by saying, what do you mean? Uh, well, 
Uh, precision in language and clarity is the enemy of the modernist. Do, do you think that they know when, they, when they're saying whatever is going on up in their head that they, that they, they might be offending somebody, that they're making other people uncomfortable no. who have a different vantage point? No, no, no. I, I, I don't think they can think that far. Mm. You see, I, I think, okay, okay, let's, let's really get to the root of it. I think that one of the big problems with today is that it's the word equality. Okay. Now, equality is not identity. Mm. But they seem to think it means it is identity. Right. I had a, a, a person tell me that equality was a box. I didn't quite understand what that meant. And then I was explained that equality is a box that you put under the feet of a shorter person when you're looking out the window so everyone can see things from the same vantage point. Mm -hmm. So I said, equality is identity? And the person said, no, equality is equality. I said, equality is a box? Now, these are, are actually conversations that take place in the university today. Wow. So that's the environment I live in. I'm, I'm just so glad that you are tenured and that you can have these discussions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. The grace thing. of God. <laughs> wow. So but, tell no, us but the good news is, okay, and I do want to add this. It's not the students who are the problem. Mm. Uh, interesting. Well, that's, that's encouraging. No, because the truth has a power of its own. And if you say it quiet, quietly, calmly, elegantly, people will listen. Mm -hmm. the, the philosophy department is the fastest growing department in number of students who are majoring in it. Really? Mm hmm That's wow. why I'm a threat. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, incredible. That makes sense. Tell, mm -hmm. us, uh, tell us, if you would, Professor, we want to get into your life, but tell us very briefly about... Your... Are you sure about that? Because I'm not. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I think by the end of this interview, people are going to want to know what makes you tick because uh, you are mm -hmm. an enigmatic figure, to say the least. But your most recent run in with your uh, department chair that you were telling us about um, just a few moments ago. Tell us that conversation, if you would. Well, I mean, it was a very nice story in the sense that. I, I was hired by Mary Clark. Now, Mary Clark was the person who wrote the Augusta, the Aquinas Reader. We all have a copy. Mm. And she was 97 when she decided I was her successor mm. and would not accept no as an answer. Nuns have that wonderful capacity, you know. So, <clears throat> and she said to me, you will build the department, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was able to hire a very good man. Now, I'm on sabbatical right now, which is crazy, because he told me in, Ma in May, well, a week before the end of the semester, that he was going to become a Catholic priest. And, and I thought, thank you. Mm. And then I had to add, because I'm a New Yorker, couldn't you have answered his call last year? <laughs> <laughs> because I meant that my sabbatical was being cut short, right? Yeah. And so that's fine, too. You accept it. And it also means that I had to fly back and forth to university for the hiring to replace him. Mm. Now, to tell you the lengths to which colleges go, I had no word on the hiring committee. Mm. My input was not even asked, even though I'm, I have an endowed chair in philosophy. Number two, Philosophy members were put in a distinct minority so that we couldn't hire. You understand? So we couldn't vote. Oh, wow. Yeah. So much for equality. <laughs> well, so much for the rule of law. Right. Then I was also told that any one of my candidates could be vetoed if the president didn't want the person. And so I made the simple argument, how can you know who are not in philosophy who a good philosopher is? Right? I mean, this is simple logic, right? Mm. And then I was told, no Catholics. And I said, well, that's interesting because that's illegal. Mm -hmm. 
It's even illegal to ask a person what his religion is in our environment or if he has one. Mm. I mean, you can't even ask, are you a he, she, an it, a dog, a cat, or anything else? You just have to assume, right? You, these are off bounds. And then I said that, to, and, and I was, the reply was silence. Mm, so, you right, as pure as doves and as prudent as serpents. That's we right. have to be prudent mm. and learn how to. Doing this show with you people is not that very prudent, but that's okay. Faith is <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, mu- we, we must have struck gold because you're on sabbatical and maybe you're not making the most prudent decisions, but we're happy to have you. Um, let's, let's get it. First of all, where, where are you right now? I'm in Padova. Padova is in northern Italy, St. Anthony of Padua. Oh, very, wow. Very nice. And how much longer are you going to be there? I'm leaving for the Balkans on Sunday. Okay. Wow. Do you, after, do you, after Mass. Do you normally go to Europe for sabbatical? No, but my godmother's husband is dying. Oh. And I ask all of you, no, he's being heroic about this. Mm. Tremendously heroic. He just came back to the church oh. a year ago. Oh, bless oh, be God. Wow. That's beautiful. And <laughs> it's a learning experience for all of us, but also in the beauty of death. Um, and the communion that can come when you can truly have a, mm. an ex- a, a real conversation. Um, I'll, I'll just give you some of the ins and outs, which I find very beautiful. He was one of my professors at the university, because uh, I also have a DPhil from the University of Padova. And um, <clears throat> when I saw him, I said, you're reminding me of the Fido, right? Socrates, the day of Socrates' death. Because the definition of philosophy is philosophy is the practice of death, according to Plato, right? Mm-hmm. And um, he said, no, it's not my strength. It's his, pointing up. Mm. And he gets the sacraments daily, which is extremely beautiful. It's a headache, too, because you have to find someone who can bring them to the house, but that's fine. Sure. You can always find someone. Wow. That's Isn't it amazing. beautiful? That is amazing. So, that is. so you get to live in the in the area which Saint Anthony uh, Padua finding fi- finding things during your sabbatical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not Writing anything. a book on Job. Oh, fantastic! What what and the and the topic specifically around Job? No, I think we're living in the book of Job. Ah, oh, that's a take. And why do you say that, Doctor? Yeah. Well, think about it. What did Job say? I mean, first of all, this whole adventure of mine on Job started when I read Aquinas' commentary on it. And what's fascinating about Aquinas' commentary is that it's literal. Mm. Say, right, Gregory the Great wrote the wonderful, the Moralia in Job. And um, it's, it's a metaphorical take. But when I was reading through Aquinas' commentary, first of all, it's philosophical and not theological which is already a point that's important. But the second important point, as I'm reading through, I'm recognizing the landscape we're living in. Right, Mm -hmm. Job says the first thing, he wants to be aborted. Why wasn't I aborted? Abortion is throughout the first chapters of the book of Job. Mm -hmm. So is the despair he's living in. Mm -hmm. How much you... Why do you commit suicide? And you look at the suicide rates. Then you look at those god awful people. I mean, forgive me for saying that, but I don't want friends like those. You know, hit the friends who come and talk to Job to get him out. All they're doing is saying it's his fault. And it sounded and and a lot of the arguments they came out with sounded curiously like Greta. You know, Greta. The one who says it's all our fault that the world oh, is coming to us. Yes, yeah. yes, the little, yeah, the little uh, what, European fourteen-year-old. Mm-hmm. We stole her childhood, um, even though she yes, right. has that a, one. a wonderful that one. childhood. Yeah, yes, that one. Mm-hmm. Mm. Even though I think she's still a child, and I think she could go back to school. I'm sorry, I'm I'm this blunt. I'm I hope 
no one is getting offended, but this is how blunt I am. No, this is good. No, we wrote a full disclaimer for this show just for you. No, we give that disclaimer to all of our... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Well, that's fantastic. So you're 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 on sabbatical, but what, where did you start out? What where what was your where, where were you where are you from originally, and uh, what was your formation? Okay, I'm a New Yorker, um, but I have a disclaimer on that. I'm a New Yorker. My family is from New York, even though my grandparents were from Philadelphia. Um, but my parents, my mother was foreign service. So I grew up, I was born in Munich. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're German. <laughs> no, actually, I'm not. I'm American. <laughs> gotcha. I, I didn't there's, some good, in- there's some good Germans these days. There it is. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you, y'all moved around a lot then? Mm-hmm. And then I, um, so I've lived in different countries. So, you know, Germany, Italy, Austria, to name some. And then I had this crazy education at a certain point I decided I had to go study in the United States and my parents were very um against this because they wanted me close closer to them in Europe and I said no I'm going home and so then they said we're not paying and I said that's fine I'll get a scholarship which I did and then I went to the best bidder which happened to be NYU Hmm. Uh which was fine Homecoming. It was. And then after I finished my bachelor's, I decided that I needed to get a uh, a degree from Europe, too. So I went to the University of Padova, where Aquinas' teacher went. So Albert the Great studied at Padova. Wow. It's the low, oldest continuous Aristotelian school in the world. So I went there. And then when I finished there, my godmother said to me, okay, now I need you to get me a couple of PhDs at the same time. I said, okay. So I got one from Fordham and I got one from the Catholic University of Milan and I did the work at the same time. Wow. That's who I am. Yeah. (laughs) And then life became even more exciting and then it was getting a job teaching building Mm -hmm. playing some concerts now and then yeah that's that's why i'm writing books i love writing i love lecturing did you say playing concerts yeah tell tell us about that i play the piano oh oh wow that's fantastic any particular um style genre that you're attracted to as in Baroque or yes, yes. time period. Uh, Bach is uh-huh. really Bach, isn't he? Uh huh. But Mozart is fun sometimes. Yes. Beethoven is some of Beethoven is glorious. Um, And we are back with Professor Nash Marshall, who is broadcasting from Padua, Italy. Connection's a little shaky, but we are so glad to have you, Professor. One of the things that um, I have to confess, I've only read one of your books, and it's this one right here, What It Takes to Be Free. And I came across this book because of your commentary, particularly on the French Revolution. You were talking about the commentary of this time period in a docudrama about the French Vendée. Um, and I was so taken with your commentary there. Can you walk us through the principal errors of the French Revolution and then how you see that playing out in the United States today? Happily. Um, When the United States declared independence, we started a movement. And the movement was what Palmer calls the great democratic revolution. And it was built upon this principle, right? That um, good government is, is granted in consent of the governed. And at that time, there were plenty of churchmen who agreed with this. Aquinas ultimately does when it comes to um, civil society, right? And he has to because we're, we're 
free human beings, and he knows that. In France, this whole democratic movement came mixed up with rationalism at that time and idealism in the make because ideal, what, what does this mean? Let me boil it down to a nutshell. If you read the father of modern philosophy, Rene Descartes, and stop me if I'm boring, by the way. No, no, Descartes, um, Descartes is great. The first person to ever tell you don't trust your senses. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, exactly. Therefore, no Eucharist, no nothing. In any case, yeah. back to there. In the second chapter of his discourse on method, he writes out and he says that the best possible thing to do with the material world, which, by the way, he thought was devoid of any kind of intrinsic value, mm -hmm. would be to destroy the city and rebuild it according to rational principles formulated by one man. And he literally goes on and on and on about this. And as long as it's a philosophical theory, then, you know, oh, well, you just say the guy must be on something. The problem is that people took him seriously, and the French Revolution is the moment in which this happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so who's really at the head of what is really the first horrendous revolution are a group of intellectuals. Mm-hmm and uh, who believe that they can reconstruct the world according to the image and likeness of their ideas, and that their ideas are necessarily true, and that those ideas can't be disproven by concrete facts, because never trust your senses, right? <laughs> and, and this particular revolution is unlike other revolutions in history insofar as it's not a popular revolution, but as you said, it is guided by an intelligentsia, a very small fraction oh. of people, right? And who will, absolutely tiny, they were called a mountain. Mm. And they took radical control, and they decided to destroy Catholicism. They literally did because it was, quote-unquote, irrational. It didn't fit with their ideas. The Vendée, I mean, obviously, you know, they did away with the nobility um, yeah. and the traditions. They tried to change every aspect of everyone's life. Mm. They changed the calendar to 10 months, not 12, because that's not rational. Um, every week had to have 10 days, not seven because that's not rational. Mm. It's the new metric system. Now, what are you going to do with the Catholics? And there was one group that was particularly resistant to them, and they were in the Vendée. They were also quite wealthy. They were wealthy farmers. Um, and so what they did was, we have all the orders that were written to send armies and to kill the man, woman, child, which is what they did. And historians, by the way, speaking about academia, um, his name is Sujet, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, Sichy. Actually, was never admitted into the Academy of France for writing a book called The French Genocide. And he makes a claim, it's a very strong claim, that the first genocide ever truly in the modern world was the genocide of the Catholics in the Vanda. Hmm. And the way he does it to prove genocide, you have to have the orders whose intent is to kill and in whole, or in whole or in part an ethnic, religious, or political group. Right? Mm -hmm. And they're in religious group. Obviously, they're the Catholics. We have the orders to kill them in whole, in whole, and therefore what we have is tantamount to genocide. Uh, Sisha never got a job as a university professor, as far as I know. Hmm. He was excluded from the academy. As sometimes happens with uh, people who have unpopular views. Catholics, because they're Catholics, is not a genocide. Is a genocide. How do you deny that? Well, uh, it, perhaps it starts with a denial of objective reality, and then it's an outgrowth from that. <laughs> That's exactly where it starts. But you see, mm -hmm. but it feeds it. Mm -hmm. 
and then you're asking me, how does it inform the United States today? What happened to us? Yeah, that's the question. I mean, the the principles which uh, in, enlightened the uh, French Revolution, principally liberty, equality, fraternity, you see some of those echoed, uh, perhaps even started here in the American Revolution, which started before the French Revolution. The two were much different, but I was hoping that you could tell us how we have been influenced by the French Revolution and why that particular instance in history is such a landmark event in the history of man. Okay, well, okay, a landmark event because never before had people tried to base a system simply on human ideas as opposed to traditions Mm -hmm. and religion. They cut out religion altogether. Remember, the Temple of Notre Dame, they turned into the Temple to the Goddess Reason. Mm -hmm. Right, so let's just remember this is part of the intellectual mission. Um, How bad was it? It was the first time that anyone actually physically tried to implement on that scale a series of ideas without accepting any correction. Mm -hmm. And especially not correction from the senses, and especially trying to strip mankind of his faith. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most important things. The second, I think, with the French Revolution was that, let's remember that all the German idealists, so Hegel, Fichte, Schelling, thought this was the greatest thing possible. We have to do this too. Mm -hmm. And let's remember Marx is Hegel's student. So it goes straight into Marx. Mm -hmm. And this is why the Russian Revolution of... uh, right, of 1917, is actually the the same thing happening. Mm. And by the way, now you ask me how it's happening in our country now. And and I would say something like this. We're living in an age of intellectual terrorism. (laughs) Where people, uh, we are. I like that phrase. But it's true. I hear people telling me that things are true and I ask them for proof or for evidence, and they claim they have it. Well, if you have it, show it. Mm. I'm not an idiot. Show me why it's true, or what is true, or what I should believe and why I should believe it. Mm -hmm. Respect Mm -hmm. my freedom. But of course they don't. I'll give you some examples. When, When Bruce Jenner, said that he felt like a woman it made no sense to me I I don't understand how he could feel like a woman how does he know what a woman feels like I, I, I'm so, I'm sure. Sh- am I shocking you? No, no, no. This is, no. This is. I think that our audience is going to really dig this. Uh, this because yeah, objectively in reality, in the real world, it doesn't matter how you feel. Your feelings cannot change the reality uh, of the situation. I would like to no, go back and I, ask you a I question. I was offended that... as a female when he said that. I was offended. Mm-hmm. I know what it's like to feel like a female. Yeah, you, you don't. You don't see it. a bunch of. Uh of women of, you know, sound mind running around saying, yeah, you know, I know exactly what men feel like or what men, what's going on in men, men the way that men, men process things differently. Biologically, gentlemen, we're very different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Certain things happen to us every month that don't happen to you. And that's part of feeling like a woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Better you say that than I. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, how did how is this happening? I, it's very politically incorrect for me to be saying this right now. Yeah. Oh, I, for sure. Yeah, for sure. But it's not. It's irrational for me to to admit that it's possible. Mm. Yeah. So you're 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 stuck in, between a rock and a hard place. You've got the brute force of of the intellectual terrorists who are trying to bully you into accepting their worldview. Whereas on the other side, you have your, your rationality, which tells you that what they're saying is false. So you have a gun to your head, and the question is, do I, do I capitulate or not? 
And I say the best and the best weapons we have is laughter. <laughs> Amen to Very that. True. Amen to Very that. Very true. <laughs> Professor, mm-hmm. if you'll if you'll permit, I want to go back to something that you said that perhaps is something that our audience at least has not heard before, and that's the explicit link that you just made earlier between the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution. Because I think most people coming out of school today are under the belief that the American and French revolutions are good and they're all about liberty, justice, equality, and freedom, and that the Bolshevik Revolution is, is misguided and that there is no link between those two things, and nothing to see here, moving on. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, sure. Let's just go to concrete evidence, because I really think I like concrete evidence. Do you mind? Please. When the encyclopedists, so Robespierre and and, and these people who are actually, I'm not going to say they're evil people. I'm going to say they're misguided. They're people who literally think they can build paradise on the face of this earth that all we have to do is eradicate the evil to give, in order to build this paradise and to give people power, power to the people of France, right? The saint culotte. Now, as we know, they went about this through a regime of terror. We were talking before about evidence and the importance of it. Um, The committee of public safety of the uh, French Revolution needed no evidence to uh, hang a per- uh, to condemn a person to death. They guillotined them, right? Um, it was suspicion. It was the law of suspicion. All you had to do, be, uh, to do was be suspected, and that was enough to have you condemned to death. Now, while this is going on, and this is a time of great passion in France, obviously, and Edmund Burke was the only thinker who actually came out publicly and said, this is wrong and this is dangerous. That's Edmund Burke. As for the other thinkers, now that the philosophy at that moment is going into Germany, and that's where the stronghold is going to become. The strong German thinkers at that time, so Kant, Hegel, Fichte, mm-hmm. Schelling, mm-hmm. are all in love with the French Revolution. They all think that this is something that is kind of marching orders. We should do the same thing, make the world more rational, make it better for people who can't do their own thinking, right? Mm-hmm. And they all worked under the principle that an idea is more real than concrete reality is real. So if you look at Kant's moral ethics, for instance, he's going to claim that ethics is built on intentions, not on concrete actions. Right. It's all my thinking, right? So concrete evidence has no part in their in their uh, worldview. But what they really do see is this philosopher's taking over, and they're thinking philosopher king. Now. Fichte gave his discourse on the German nation and and was extolling what the French were doing. And uh, Hegel, too, didn't write discourse on the German nation, but was truly in love with this whole thing. Now, the next big thinker, so the, the most famous student of Hegel's, so the next generation, Hegel, Fichte, Schelling, is Marx. Mm. Marx deliberately imitating what happened in France. The atheism, people are in control, we can build a perfect world. And so that's the the direct line. They did it quite deliberately. Mm. But here's another important thing for you, because from France in the 19th century, European thinkers in the 19th century are truly dangerous. And they are very, very different from our thinkers. So think of Kant, who actually thought he's the father of progressivism. Mm. Yep. He thought that we could actually build a religion of man on 
the premise that we can build a, a paradise on Earth. That's Kant. Now mix Kant with Marx, and you've got a mess. <laughs> that sounds like a mess. That sounds like a dystopian <clears throat> hell. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting, Doctor. I'm sure you, uh, especially being a Catholic, you hear plenty enough about the uh, of assaults on the church, et cetera, and well, the church back at th- in this century did this, and the church at that century did that. And it, just take take the the actual facts of those situations aside mm-hmm. for a moment. It, it, it's I find that it's it's entertaining when people refer to the the Catholic Church in that way, and yet the their whole philosophy and everything that they're built around. You know, you had the French Revolution, which was absolutely horrible, right? People get this a- a impression that it was really the people who were revolting because they were just starving and they were hungry and was, yeah. yeah, not everything happened the way that it was supposed to, but, you know, they were just so hungry and so poor that way, they just lost their minds. If they were that hungry, they would not have fought because the starving people cannot fight. True. Very true, actually. It's a great point. <laughs> Back to the facts, yeah. right? <laughs> but then, then then, you have, like you're, you're saying, you're tying the philosophers to the actual revolution. So, of course, Marx mm-hmm. is the basics of the, the communist revolution. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have world wars that are fought on completely anti-Catholic principles. And, you, you know, the and, and, and Marx and, and the entire communist revolution make the... F- French Revolution looked like, uh, you know, a, a blip on the radar. Perfect. By the way, do you know who knew this, who said this way before me? Was a man by the name of Leo X. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Leo X made the moves that he made because he knew exactly what was going on, mm-hmm. which is why we have the Catholic social doctrine. Mm-hmm. Right, and and then there are Navarum. We have all of these documents that he wrote, but it's also when the when he called Thomism back into the picture. Yep, he asked the attorney Patris, and the reason for that was because he knew we needed a strong philosophical response to the this very 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 dangerous worldview. That is undermining the West. Mm-hmm. All of it. And, it. and it seems like it continues to undermine the West. Um, as you think about being a, a, a an endowed uh, chair of philosophy mm-hmm. and, and having a tenured position, I think most people are have have the view that a that a philosophy professor really is kind of like a you know a harmless being. But what you're saying is that the ideas that can be espoused can 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 be so dangerous and so world moving as joe said they can cause world wars well they did cause world wars i i, I want to get back to a simple point we're in an ideological world right now in our country mm-hmm. that's how dangerous philosophy is mm. I, I think that If you look at the history of the last 500 years in the Western world, you'll see how dangerous ideas are and how important it is for us to be able to think them through. Um, How many people died in the name of communism? I would guess over 100 million, but uh, that, that might be an overstatement. No, it's an understatement. Wow. It's an understatement. Take China... And take Stalin. You've already got 100 million there. That's incredible. I, I, I don't know if I can even compute that number. Yeah, that's a, it's a number that our brains yeah, have, have a hard time grasping. And yet you see movements for communism, even perhaps on the campus at which you teach. It's ignorant. You see, that's the problem. We're not responding in the way... At least this is my humble opinion, and I pray to God that I'm right. We're not giving an alternative. Or what I mean to say is something like this. We have been effectively shut out of the academic world. Mm. Unless you have an idiot like me who's still trying to fight Mm. in the trenches. Um, How do you... Get the truth across when 
we have an education program, which is such that once they hit high school, they just have to learn certain formulas by rote and repeat them, and that's called knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at our mistakes in the United States, I think in the 20th century, something like this happened. And I'm, I'm still thinking it through. Think it through with me. How is it that in the 1950s, mainstream literature included people like Graham Greene and Evelyn Wall, who are both of whom are Catholic, right? Mm -hmm. Or Bruce Marshall, who's another Catholic. And in today's mainstream, there are none. Yeah. It's, it's very true. What, what, what happened? How did we go wrong? And I think part of it was after World War II, those who were in power in the United States thought that they had won the war. Mm. We're done, right? We don't, we're part of the mainstream now. Right. Not realizing that by doing that, they were conceding, they were throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Mm. If you stick to the truth, if you stick to the principles, if you say your daily rosary, if you do these things that in the 50s were not very uh, popular, in the 60s they weren't, then we can stay firm. But if you think, no, we've won the battle, well, then you're turning yourself into God, right? Yeah, sure. And that leads us to the inflection point of the of the <coughs> uh, sexual revolution in the United States in the 1960s. And that's around the same time that you started to see, even within the church, a divorce from Thomism and from realism. That's right. And, and that's why I'm saying, now, in order to get it back, I don't think it's enough to sit back and yell and shout and do these things. We have to show how beautiful it is. Yes. How beautiful the truth is. How be how much fun we have. I mean, I'm having fun with you. I hope I'm not boring you. No, but I'm this having is fantastic. Fun. We're gonna have a three hour show with you, Professor. So just <laughs> so just sit back, get comfortable, because <laughs> this is not ending. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, look, it's it's we're having fun and it's joyful. Crack jokes, live, learn how to cook, play the piano, make a mess, fall down, get back up. It's fine. <laughs> You know, it, the, the, point you're, the point you're making is interesting because when you look into the faces of the feminist, of the liberal, of the mm -hmm. progressivists, there is always an undertone of anger. They are always angry. We are the joyful people. <clears throat> and that's and let's just show it. Let's just show how much fun it is to reason, how much fun it is to sit around a table and eat dinner together. Or, or just to read poetry, or write poetry, write bad poetry, write good poetry, just write something, <laughs> and do some thinking. Yes, yes, for Joe, sure. Joe, it, right. like, it sounds like you and I need to get to northern Italy and have some good old-fashioned Italian food for dinner. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know what, I can bring you an Armenian wine that'll knock your socks off. Ooh. All right, well. Okay, so you said the word Armenian, so yeah. this is not a joyful topic, obviously, but you did write a book about this. Could you tell us a little bit about the Armenian genocide that very few people know? Okay, it also follows from the French Revolution. You mean, mm -hmm. This is all genocide start there. It's this idea to, I call it the moment when ph philosophy becomes uh, the attempt to become demiurges, right? Social demiurges. If you mm -hmm. notice, do you notice how many people today have, tell other people how they should live and don't bother to do any living themselves? <laughs> I feel that way myself I, sometimes. <laughs> you know, but you know what? I laugh at myself when I do that, but no, you have to do this. You have to do this. Are, they're giving us orders how we must live. Uh, In the meanwhile, they're not living. You're not making an oblique reference to Al Gore's private jet, are you? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I, I did. Now that you mention it, it was kind of in there. <laughs> Well, yeah, but but you see, but you can put anyone in there. We should all laugh at these people, and they're telling us how to live, and feeling all sanctimonious about it. Mm -hmm. And and I'm thinking, would you take that pressure off your back? You're not God. We can't make infinite mistakes. 
Mm. Right? No, it's really it's not on me. I'm a child. Do you know Latin mass starts with introibo ad altare dei, right? And that it's Deus ad qui letificat juventutem meam. God who gives joy to my youth. Mm-hmm. Because we're children. And we are going to flub. We can't help it. So don't think we can. I mean, so I wish the dourness of these people thinking that they have their moral obligation is to turn us into good citizens who know how to live properly. And, and let's just live. Let's go have some ice cream. <laughs> I'm going to leave the thermostat where it is. Thank you very much. And yes, I will have two scoops. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and you know what? Aquinas said that it's immoral. It's actually a sin to think that human beings are the cause of the end of the world. Mm. Wow. <laughs> well, um, newsflash, uh, Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you could write that in shorter than 200 pages? I just said in one sentence, Aquinas <laughs> said that it's sin. <laughs> Ah, oh, so weird! Wow, so weird. Um, I'm I, here. I was thinking <clears throat> that my straws might might be a mortal sin. Amazing. No, okay, so no. so you were you were you were leading us into the Armenian story, Armenia, and I think Armenia, I think a lot okay. of these people right. in, out there don't know this story, and I certainly didn't okay. until I lived in Little Armenia, in L.A. Okay, Armenia is the first Christian nation. So let's just put this in our pipes, smoke it, and. John Paul II, St. John Paul II, was the first one to celebrate this on the 1700th anniversary of the conversion of the nation of Armenia Mm -hmm. in the year 2001. And that's an important thing. Now, there are also Eastern Christians. Mm -hmm. We always forget about our Eastern brothers. We do. They're dying as we speak. Mm. No one helps them. Um, Lebanon is up in arms. How easy is it going to be for the Maronites? How easy is it going to be for the Melkites? For the Chaldeans? Antiochians? These are, by the way, those three are all Catholics. There are three different rites of the Catholic Mm -hmm. Church. So let's just, oh, let me step back. How many rites does the Catholic Church have? A dozen or more. uh, That's a trick question. (laughs) No, it's not. No, it's not. We should know this. There, there are more than 25. Wow. Mm. Two dozen. We are the model of diversity. People talking to us about diversity these days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In India, we have two rites, the Syro Malabar and the Syro Malankar. And I hate to tell you that it's, they're not white men. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met one yet. <laughs> no, they're not white men. I mean, they're, they're from India. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In the Middle East, we have tens of them. Oh, okay. Sure. The sure. point is, Armenia is one of these, and, and there is an Armenian right too. Now, in 1915, Turkey implemented this plan, and that was they wanted to erase the existence of the Armenians from the face of the earth and from the face of Anatolia to be able to claim that the land was theirs. They're working on a crazy principle that came out in Europe, uh, which is basically land belongs to the indigenous populations. That comes out with the revolution in Greece. Mm. Okay. And they have a long long history and a a big bone to pick with the Armenians. The Armenians and Greeks get along. Mm -hmm. Turks don't. Right. And so the Turks want to create a perfect haven for the Turks, and so what they have to do is destroy all the Christian presence. Mm. They declared the jihad. And who got it in the teeth were the Armenians. The Western world knew fully well that the Armenians were in danger. And by the Western world, I mean France and England and Russia primarily, because the United States, of course, had nothing to do with the rest of the world at that time, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So 1878, they all realized that the Armenians are in danger. And instead of responding to it with concrete actions to defend them, they decide to play politics amongst each other. 
who was going to pick the biggest part of the Ottoman Empire away for itself. So France, England, Russia are the primary culprits. In the 20th century, um, oh, by the way, uh, there's a new group of radicals like the French who have been educated in German philosophy. Does this sound familiar to you, by the way? <laughs> Themes. Uh, History rhymes. And uh, they go after the Armenians. They go after the Greeks first. They get on the coasts, uh -huh. then the Armenians, and a million and a half of them are killed. Now, the Turkish, uh, the Republic of Turkey, which is built upon the grave of Armenia, by the way, mm -hmm. still denies this happened. Mm -hmm. They just, the Armenians had 2,500 churches. Of them functioning today are two, five maybe. Oh, my gosh. Outside of the capital. Okay, this is what happened. Now, in order to help the Christians in the Middle East, that's why I set up Christians in the Foundation. Because it serves a double purpose. If we send, when I sent my graduates to teach English logic and ethics to the Christians in the Middle East, now Armenia above all, um, it helped my students. I would say even more than it helped the Armenians on the front line. Because mm -hmm. there's this place called Nagorno Karabakh, Artsakh which Stalin gave to Azerbaijan. So it's an enclave of 150,000 Christians, surrounded by 8 million Muslims, by the way. And they're holding their own. Wow. They're holding the front. Now, when I sent students out there, they finally realized who the hell cares about same-gendered bathrooms or no-gendered bathrooms. Or, uh, they... they <laughs> this is... Hashtag the first call I got was from a student saying, Nash, Nash, there's a big problem. What's that? And she was there for a week. Mm. Children are playing on their own outside. I said, where's the problem? <laughs> and she said, I said, that's how I grew up. Mm -hmm. No one has to supervise them. I said, why supervise the children? They know how to play. You don't have to teach them how to play. They know how to play. Let them have fun. Mm. And what I notice is when American young, I mean, this kid was 19 when he called me. Mm. And he, he said, well, this is how you're supposed to live? I said, I think so. I think it was a lot of fun. My parents don't know half of what I did when I grew up. Right. When I was growing up, do your parents know how many times you... Uh, scraped your knee or did something like that. No, I mean, you were on your own, right? It's called being free, right? Oftentimes I was trying to hide it because there was like a hole in my pants too. And that, and it, my, my father said, skin grows back, but uh, clothes don't. So don't do that. <laughs> I'm dirty either, right? So you don't, you don't know. And so that, that's who the Armenians are. And they're, they're actually holding the front for us. For us. The mm -hmm. front Western world. Wow. You know, the, doctor, you bring up something that's Be that's very that's very interesting. Be oh, are you back, doctor? Perfect. Um, so there's something that you brought I'm up that that was very interesting, which I'm was back. I'll wait till this can normalize. By the way, you can call me Siobhan. I have no problem with that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, for someone who earned two simultaneous and concurrent PhDs, I might have to, I might have to not do that. <laughs> uh, but but you bring up an interesting point, Doctor. Even with with regards to you know mass genocides in like the one in Armenia the one in the French Revolution, the one in the Communist Revolutions in Russia, the one in China, I mean, all around the world. Do you, do you find that one of the biggest problems here is, is that as Americans, as non-isolationist as we are in policing the world, as far as our, our population that has dealt with nothing of any real consequence from that kind of a, a scale, makes it very difficult to move that Amer move the American mind to have a greater concept of what's going on out there. 
I'd go back to the 50s because if there's any any people who is single-handedly responsible for the survival of Armenia, it's the United States. Mm. We, uh, and I mean that physically and literally. The United States, the people of the United States donated to, donated to what was then called the Near East Foundation, mm-hmm. Near East Relief. Mm-hmm. And uh, we sent food to the dying Armenians, to the starving Armenians at the time. Huge publicity campaign. I don't know how many millions of dollars were raised that America sent. We just sent food. We literally were buying lives, mm. buying their lives. And we set, we built the orphanages and the schools so that these people could live again. I mean, believe me, it's it, in the 19, we knew full well in 19, 1915 what our priorities were. I think what happened is that at a certain point we started to take, I think we got, I, I think that in the 60s and in the 50s when Catholics kind of pulled back and said we had won and so we can go into the mainstream and let the mainstream come to us, we also had a whole series of intellectuals who had come into the United States fighting you know, playing Hitler, right? Mm-hmm. They taught in our schools. And they were like, they were mostly communists, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's a twofold movement. And so then all of a sudden people didn't have the formation necessary to say, but hold on. When you say equality in the French Revolution, It certainly doesn't mean the same thing as it means in the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. When we talk Bill of Rights in the United States, we believe these grant we don't think the grand human nature, right? That God created man. It's right in our Declaration of Independence. Yeah. We have a very religious background to our conception of the Bill of Rights. The French do not. If you look at the Bill of Rights of the French Revolution, those rights were granted by the state. They're not innate, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So our view of liberty is of an innate uh, characteristic that people have because they are created this way by God. That's what our text says. And by inalienable means that no one can remove them. People might not recognize them, but they cannot be removed. The French Revolution, the French Bill of Rights, grant these things. They don't think they're innate. So it's a radical Radically different situation. Mm. See, we're built on the concrete human person. They're built on a, a series of people who are granting people rights. It's very good. But if you don't have like, the training to deal with this, you're going to think the same word means same thing. Yep. And I think that we lost several generations because of this. I'm sorry to sound so negative, but I think that's what happened. Reality. No, it's true. And now this is this this highlights the importance of what of the work that you're doing, Professor, uh, because I will tell you that I myself have been in Ankara, Turkey, the capital. I've toured Ataturk's personal library, and I bore witness to the uh, propaganda machine that was there around um, around creating this uh, basically canonization of Ataturk and the whitewashing of the history uh, that they did there. By the way, I, I did go to a Chaldean mass when I was in Baghdad as well. Um, the point is, is that in a, in a society like that, where you can suppress the truth and you can whitewash history, that happens because of the violent takeover 
or perhaps a nonviolent takeover of academia. So there you are in academia, <laughs> Professor Nash Marshall, uh, fighting the good fight, talking about Christian things, trying to return our, us to a, a Christian culture. Um, and that's really where Ground Zero is. Yes, and I need your help because we all need to band together. I think that the mystical body of Christ needs to come together. And I know that many Americans, good Americans, are right, rightfully uh, mistrustful of academics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have some good guys out there. We do. Absolutely. Let's talk to each other. Let's go around, explain things, have fun. Uh, another thing is, uh, I was saying about help. Let's all pray for each other, too. I think we have a chance, since things have become so ugly, if with proper prayer, we have a battle of Lepanto going on right now in our country. Yep. Are we going to win it? Well, if we stand together, we will. Absolutely. That, that, that is what is part of being Catholic, right, is, is unity and, and operate and, and, and functioning and, and moving forward and attacking the enemy where the enemy is in a unified way. With the theological virtue of hope, as you have articulated. Always. 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 So, any other questions, gentlemen? They're going to call me for dinner in about five minutes. <laughs> well, good. We will, uh, we will be ending the show there. Professor Nash Marshall coming to us from Padua, Italy. She's headed to the Balkans next week. She's a world traveler. I really recommend this book, What It Takes to Be Free, to just start the conversation about how do we talk about freedom? How do we understand the what's happening in America? Thank you so much for talking to us, Professor. I think we're the first ones you've been on with, and we will have you on again soon. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you.